thank you for being here this morning. And actually, I was looking at, I'm always curious how many parents show up to the Arabic Talk Tuesday. And this is a pretty good turnout, by the way. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, <laughs> yes, so thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, and the weather is getting nice. You might have spent this morning at the beach having a cup of coffee, but you prefer to be here. So thank you for that. It shows your interest in the program. Um, I'm Azin Sheikh, the director of the program. And, and this is my fifth year at the Ameri American School of Dubai. I've worked before in Bahrain, in Oman, and Beirut, so uh, as the head of the Arabic program. So, and I always find that Arabic programs in international schools are in a unique place. Uh, we have mixed nationalities, mixed backgrounds, various expectations from kids, from teachers, from parents, sometimes in dealing with the local ministries as well. So we have to take all this into consideration. Uh, today's session is an overview of the program. The purpose of the session is basically as an audience, new parents, new families to ASD, returning families are always welcome to attend as well. Just to give an overview what the program is about and just to see if you have any questions as well. We will have two more Arabic program talk Tuesday during the school year, one in November 13, and I will talk about this. Uh, we have an Arabic author visiting, but she will conduct kind of a session for the parents. And March 26, uh, we always like to have another one uh, during the middle of the school year where I tell you about what have been accomplished so far and what changes or things you should expect as an updates for the coming school year as well, because we're in continuous improvement, okay? Good. So this is the agenda for today, an overview, and then I will talk about the curriculum foundation of the program as well. We'll talk about the uh, whole program events coming this year and ways where you can also help and support the program uh, and get involved. And we're going to talk about how you can support your child's Arabic learning at home, whether you know Arabic or not. Okay? And then uh, we prepared snapshots from the actual Arabic classrooms to give you an idea what your children will be doing in the Arabic class. Uh, and then to see if you have any questions or answers. I would like to start with this. So raise your hand if you know to speak at least one language. That's a great start for this morning. OK. Two languages. Good. Well, we have many bilingual parents with us today. OK. Three languages. Pretty impressive. OK. Four. Wow. OK. All right. Five. All right, good. Five, five languages. Okay, so what are the language, five languages you know? Um, Spanish, English, uh, Dutch, uh, Arabic, Spanish, English, Dutch, Arabic, and Arabic. Wonderful. Wow, wow, wow. Great. Okay, congratulations. Yeah. They, 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 there is abundance of research that tells us the more languages we know, the easier we are in acquiring more languages. And this is, this is we know that. So that's great. Uh, okay. So I want you now to th go back. You are all clever students during school years. I want you to think back to your language class at school, whether it was first language or a second language, and think about how do you remember this experience? Was it a positive one, a welcoming one, or was it a threatening, scary, overwhelming one? So I want you to think about this and think about what helped you learn this language well, if any. And then, what didn't help you learn it well? Okay? I want you to think about those questions and share with the person sitting next to you or in front of you. Okay? Give you a few minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm using with you some strategies we use in the classroom, like raising my hand and being quiet till you get quiet. And also I notice when I divide you into pairs, I notice when to stop when the sound gets a bit low. This means you're ending the conversation. Okay, these are some strategies we use as well. So let me hear some of your thoughts about this past language experience. Anybody would like to share? Please. Back to outside the classroom. At all, it was mm. just not used. Now I come back to my happy Indian family. We don't talk in French, so I didn't mm. have anyone to converse with. But I was bubbling inside, and the words that I spoke then. Look how beautifully I think I said that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty well, it was actually. Some Hawaii people. It was pretty well. Go to Lebanon. So. So let me let me stop you here. You said that your experience in learning French was great. Why? So the level of interest was high in learning the language. But the challenge was finding somebody outside the class to practice with. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Immersion yeah. environment. Well, unfortunately, okay. my daughter we moved from there to New York, so she was only four and a half years old, and she lost her Spanish. So the importance of the environment that uses the language around the learner yeah. is very important as well, whether it's inside the class or outside the class. Okay. Any others? Yes, please. Yeah, the experience I learned in French is the teachers. Uh, you speak on his behalf. Okay, all right. <laughs> because the teacher, sorry, the teacher was? They were very aggressive in the class. Aggressive, okay. And I like learning French because my teacher was actually kind and loving and caring in the classroom. So, yeah, okay. so, the, teacher. so the teacher, the teacher, not necessarily the teacher knowledge, really the, teacher, the report between yeah. the student and the teacher is important in the approach. Okay. They want to make sure you're on the right track, right? I okay. French, but I... Ones that you know, were the older kids, so enthusiastic and just so fun and interesting. 
wanted to learn design. I feel like that would be good because you have different sensibilities. Yes. So we'll always remember the teachers. I, I still remember my third grade teacher for the first time since I had dog training. Like you'll always remember the people that were um, in there and the way they taught you, whether you learned or not. It's just, of course, you learn and yes. you learn a lot, yes. but you don't realize yes. it until the end because yes. of their approach yes. and their rapport, like you said, with the children. And honestly, yes. I think more than anything else, that's what's Right, building, the, reaching the heart before the mind, as we say, right? And it's, it's interesting, when we remember our past teachers, the first things we remember about those who impacted us is actually the relationship. We remember their jokes, their character, how much comfortable we were interacting with them, and then we remember the information and the skills they taught us, because this comes first. So that's, uh, that's amazing. Same thing when I remember my uh, language teachers at school. Uh, and I remember my Arabic languages specifically, I hated Arabic before grade 8 because it was just the grammar and memorization and it was pointless. When I hit the grade 9, there's an Arabic teacher who really made me love the language. Language games and interactions and trivia questions, those kind of things uh, and discussions. And then I majored in Arabic at university as well. So that's how impactful it can be. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is, and that's why we put the stickers here. I tend usually to go outside the screen, <laughs> so this day will limit me. So, yes, thank you. So, when we thought of all those ideas, when we thought of the Arabic language program, and actually not only the Arabic program, the world language program at ASD, we thought, what are the three main points or transfer goals we want to, kind of our philosophy of language learning? And these here are. Uh, we strongly believe that language is not only a list of words or grammar that we just memorize, because really it's pointless. It's a tool for communication. That's the most important thing in any language. Uh, and in a wide array of real life situations, we talked about practicing the language outside the classroom. So if I'm learning a language inside the class, let's say greetings, or how to order food at a restaurant, and then if I go to an actual restaurant, I need to be able to order food using that language. So that's how, how powerful it is. And that's how we measure its effectiveness. So in, in Arabic language classrooms, we do a lot of role plays or settings that we make in the classroom to give this chance of communicative real life situation interaction. And with a wide variety of audiences, we know that we use language for formal and informal purposes. So our kids, we need to know in the future how to stand and present something at work, how to do a presentation in Arabic. That's a formal setting. And they need also to communicate with the taxi driver, probably, or uh, how to rent uh, an airfare, airline ticket, those kind of things. Okay? And take risks and seek opportunities to use the target language inside and outside the classroom. Uh, we started a few years ago providing more opportunities for the kids at ASD to interact in Arabic outside the classroom. And I will talk more about those activities. For example, field trips, uh, where they have to go and practice their Arabic, and then come back to the class and reflect how they used it. Sometimes they record their voices as well and show it to their teacher. Uh, as I said, we have an Arabic author visit coming, where they sit in a session, she reads them stories, they ask her questions about her life in Arabic, those kind of things. Uh, and culture. Uh, I think language programs will be really uh, missing the point if they don't also address culture, the Arabic culture here in this context, with learning the language. So things like, for example, we have the UAE National Day coming in November. We have discussions about that. The leaders of the UAE, the accomplishments, and those kind of things. And then what students would do is that they will start comparing their own culture, if it's not an Arab culture, with the target culture they are learning. And those comparisons and discussions are really rich as well and powerful. So this is the Arabic programs profile. We offer Arabic classes to all kids from KG to grade 12. So every child starting from KG has the option of taking Arabic up till they graduate. Okay? And we have two main proficiency tracks. We have Arabic as a native language and Arabic as a world language, okay? And I will tell you the difference between those proficiency tracks as well. So the, the, native, the native is designed for students who have some degree 
of basic speaking and listening skills. They know how to talk about daily routine topics, to talk about themselves, introduce their family. So they have this basic oral foundation. So what we do in the native classes, we work with them more on reading and writing, the literacy piece. Okay, because they know how to interact on a basic level. As for the Arabic as a word language, we know that they need support and building the foundation of speaking and listening. Okay? Uh, if I'm taking now, let's say, a German class and I don't know German, it makes sense that I start in building my speaking and listening skills before I move to reading and writing and literacy. And that's what also research tells us, that we need to have a basic foundation in speaking and listening, how to communicate, and then we can move into reading and writing. Okay? Otherwise, we will have a gap in this foundation. Yes? Um, so my daughter is in fourth grade, and she told me that in Arabic, A-A-L, like for nine years old, they're split up into two groups. Why? Yeah, I will talk about this in a second. Yes. I'll talk about, yeah, we'll address that. So, but, sorry. Yes. Uh, so in AWL, uh, it focuses not on writing, it's on more communication and speaking, it's not writing. Correct. Correct. This doesn't mean that, yes, the focus in AWL is on speaking and listening. This doesn't mean that we do not teach reading and writing at all. But most of the class time, most of the learning targets, the class is designed to focus on speaking and listening. Or for, for the natives, it will focus on reading and writing. Okay? And that's irrespective of grade level? Respective of the grade level. This is, this is kind of the approach in the program. Yes. Sorry, this division, the AWL, when, when does this happen? Uh, it happens now in K1, K1 and K2, I'm talking about the information, but that's fine. In K1 and K2, we do not uh, streamline the kids. Okay. Uh, after K2, we streamline them into native and AWL. This is not based on their nationality, this is based on the level they're at. Yes, I, I, will, I will speak about it because there is the nationality involved now with the Ministry of Education. I spoke this. Yeah, but we. we if the child is registered in the school under an Arab passport, yes. that's a Ministry of Education requirement, they have to be in the native level. That's a law. Regardless of where they're at. Regardless. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah. This is all schools in the UAE. Okay. okay. Now, other cases, it's proficiency based. Okay. So if a child is registered at ASD under an Arab passport, they have to be in a native Arabic class regardless of their proficiency. And I can talk about what do we do as an Arabic program in that case, to support them. Uh, yes? Sorry, no worries. But is there any reason why you don't separate them if a child comes from an Arabic speaking family and is much more proficient than another child in K1? Don't you think that would hold them back? In K1 with K2, uh, separation, it's no, it won't hold them back. Okay. The K2 and K2, K1 and K2, non separation at this point, it's related to elementary school being with the homeroom together at this age for a social and emotional kind of support, not a language, not an Arabic language division. That's, that's the main purpose behind it, yes. Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. We'll address more as, as, we, as we progress as well. Uh, so, for the new students uh, coming to ASD every year, we give them an assessment, a proficiency, because we don't know them, we haven't taught them before. If they have studied Arabic before, we'll give them an assessment to see what's their level. And then we put them in the right level accordingly. For, as I said, for uh, Arab registered students, they have to be in the native class by ministry requirements. Uh, and returning students will follow the normal course of progression, which you can find in the, in the handbooks, the divisional handbooks. For K1 and K2, we call it exploring Arabic. They meet every other day. And then for grade one and two, and here I'm addressing your question, we have the Arabic as a word language and Arabic as a native language. Okay, starting from grade three, we, for the Arabic as a word language strand, we have two levels. Taking into consideration, why, why we do that? Taking into consideration that we have students coming, first year learning Arabic, they have to be here. And we have students in our system and the AWLP who have learned Arabic for a number of years. So we kind of differentiate and we separate the both groups. And we continue offering, of course, the native strand as well. Strict, I assume, in terms of who gets into the native school at the moment, and grade two, there's a huge difference 
students in the native Hello? No, they're not registered under an Arabic passport. I know that for a fact, but you have students that don't speak the language. <coughs> we, we, and, and the let me clarify one thing. In the native strand, it's not only for kids who are registered in the school under Arab passport. If a child, if a child has the proficiency yeah, exactly. in speaking and listening to be able to join the native, we place them in the native. For those with an Arab passport at the school, they have to be in the native regardless. No, I understand that point. What I'm saying is, at the moment, in grade two, for getting the passport, just the level of the students, there is a huge gap. I mean, my kids you mean in the native speak, class? Native. Okay. Like, for example, my kids speak. Okay. I understand. But there are kids that don't speak a word of Arabic. So I'm sure that the class, the other students are being held back. You know? we, we can talk about, I'm not sure they are held back because we we use a lot of differentiation techniques with the help of the IAs as well. And I work closely with the teachers on the groups that need more support. And I want to call your attention also here to something about multi-levels. I really, and this is always my talk with, uh, even with the teachers and the parents, when we talk about multi-levels, we need to widen our lens a bit. Sometimes we tend, when we think of a language class, in terms of levels, our lens gets really narrow. But let's forget language for a second. Our kids in the same class are not only have differences in languages, they also have difference in characters, in attention span, and in interest. Like if, if I talk about football with a group of children, they're gonna be excited about it. If I talk about football with other, other group of students, they're gonna be like, okay, when are we moving to the other subject? I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you an example of even one student might be here in speaking, but here in listening, and then here in reading, and then here in writing. I'm just giving you, from an educator's perspective, how multi-levels, it's a more complex issue than looking at it as uh, A or B. So, but what we do, and from the placement purpose, and, and having two strands, and even three levels, as I said sometimes, A, w, L, A B, and Native, is to have this multi-level gap as, as, as small as possible. With with the differentiation techniques and the help of the IAs and those strategies that are not only in Arabic, by the way, in other subjects as well. Uh, because even in math and in English and science, we have, we have multi-levels as well. So, uh, yes? Sorry, this is really no. important that you brought that up. Sure. So you said, like you said, like any class, whether it's English, Arabic, anything, like in our classes, we have an X amount of students. And obviously, they break up into groups depending on their level because that's what the teacher is teaching all about. I want to know how many kids per teacher and do they have assistance to help them in the class for that specific purpose? Yes. In elementary school, how many students? In each Arabic class. We don't, yeah, so we don't, show. yeah, we don't, we don't have more than, I would say the biggest class is 17 to 18 students in elementary school. Would that be non-native? And, and then both, both, both. And even some classes are seven or eight students. And we have, we have three IAs that rotate regularly between those teachers to work specifically with groups or individuals that need extra support. So that's, that's based on my experience working with international schools. That's a pretty good number of students yeah. and pretty good number of support uh, for that. Yes, yeah, we'll, take, we'll take one more question around this. I think I just want to add a support to what you're saying, Mr. Mohammed. I think it's a really important uh, point here. Actually, here in the um, Let's just say English or Native. So when they have their groups or many lessons, which are three or four groups, some of them are And if, if at any moment in time you find that you have, you have a concern about <coughs> the rigorousness of what your child is learning, I think the best thing is to approach the teacher and say, hey, what units are they learning? How, how is my child doing? And I think that would be a good, if you had this concern, that really you feel that your child can be pushed more. I think that's a healthy conversation to have. Okay, so, uh, so in elementary school, it's a required subject. 
a middle school, high school, it's optional for most students. Why most students? Because of the passport thing, okay? So most students have the option, middle school and high school, to choose between Arabic, Spanish, and French. Unless they are registered in the school under Arab passport, they have to take Arabic. So students that are registered under Arabic passports cannot take them on in third language? They can. They can. And this has changed recently where to support them. So if I'm, if let's say I'm registered at school as a Lebanese citizen, I have to take native Arabic up to grade 12. But also I want to take Spanish or French. I can, okay? I can if I have satisfied some certain credits. So this can be discussed with the counselor, but there is a possibility, okay? What if they're not registered as Arabs, but they want that option, they can still do it? Option. Obligatory. Then Arabic will be considered as a word language credit. Then the Arabic they're so taking, can. yes, but it will be as a word language credit. But you can still take. They second. can still, yes, yes. Wait, wait. Very simple you can question. take a second language in middle school. It's if if let me clarify again. If you are taking Arabic but not registered in the school under an Arab passport, you can take it if you have satisfied certain core credits. So this has to be discussed with the counselor, whether it's in middle school and high school, okay? I mean, I, I only, can, to be honest, I came because I'm, uh, what is the reason behind that in middle school, because I don't know what the reason is, but in middle school, I mean, until they graduate, they don't continue with Arabic regardless of the other language they would choose. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Since day <laughs> one, until grade five, my son has been doing yes. Arabic, yes. but he wanted to do French, so... Yes. We thought, I, I, I thought, That's, oh, they will yeah. continue with Arabic until they graduate from school, but still they have the option, and this is... So you want it to be a requirement? Huh? You want it to be a requirement? Yeah. Okay. Of course, well, I right. mean, they, okay. from K1 okay. to grade 5, they, they lose it, I mean, because, you know... Right. Right. That's, we want to understand, because this is, for me, I, I only I know about it when they... I don't have answer for you, to yeah. be honest with you, for this specific question. Yeah. I know that it is, I know that it's a ministry requirement, again, that all kids, regardless of their nationality, mm -hmm. have to take Arabic up till grade nine. Now, I, th I think I think it reducing it all of a sudden to all students in this community, we need to think of all the logistics behind kids having to take Arabic instead of other courses. So it has this logistical aspect to it. Uh, but I don't have more answer for you at this point regarding this specific uh, item. Yes, yes, please. That's a great. That's, that's a great. That's a very important. Point. That's a great point. I think all of us here do do that at home. Yeah, exactly. We have so, the teachers that come help our kids yeah. and assist our kids. So I think that's, that's a great, great point. Great and an right. We pay for it, and you know, that's, that's, that's right. And that's something. It would be like a, a program supported by schools. I think. Okay, that's right. That's, that's yes. Let, let me talk about this quickly before before we continue. Because I don't want I don't want to keep it till twelve today. I'm happy. To <laughs> uh, the we started last year offering some Arabic after school activities offered by our Arabic teachers in elementary school. Now through through the camp prac. Now the camp prac this year is kind of reconsidering the structure of the after school activities. To be honest with you, by by contract, teachers do not have to offer an after-school activity, okay? So they do it out of their willing and love and care. So that's something we have to, now, if we want to have, I would love to see a really structured, ongoing Arabic after-school activities, whether it's in cooking or whether it's in drama, those kind of things. So we're thinking about it in a way, in a way that we, we introduce, in a way that's sustainable as well. Uh, whether it's somebody from ASD doing it, or somebody from outside, and this, then we have to follow on the logistics. Can I just uh, on that? Because I met with Mark Nees last year at Campus Rock. I don't think he was yeah. And he was vehemently against offering languages as part of after school activities. Yeah. He said it's meant to be more movement, sports, activities. He's like, you want to have a language, and he's been approached by French, Spanish, you know, everybody. And he said it's just not part of this, the strategy of the school. I think I think when we talk about after school activities in Arabic, we're not talking about 
drilling the kids for 50 minutes and sitting behind the desk. Yes, we're talking about something more interactive and something more engaging because we're competing with other very interesting activities at the same time, right? Football and basketball and swimming. And Right. I mean, I pitched right. all those things, and he was like, we, you know, it's just not, we've tried in the past, there were complications, there were this, this, this. And he, said, he said at some point in high school, some high school parents do volunteer to do like a Chinese tutoring session or, you know, whatever it was. But he said um, at the time the school wasn't going to be behind it. Now, I don't know. Okay, yeah. so that's something for us as an Arabic program to reconsider yeah. about how to, how to have it in a more systematic, sustainable way. And Thank you. Okay. I said we as the parents will support if you okay. support with a superintendent okay. or whatever it is, we will Sure. And when we offer it, I'm going to track you one by one to make sure to make sure you enroll your kids. So that all right. Because the last thing we want is that to, to offer it and then we see only two students registered, okay? All right. Yes, I'll have a list outside, exactly. I'm going to follow you. No, actually when we offered them last year, the, the we had to close the attendance in like one hour because it was full. So this tells us yes, even the year before. Right. So that was very positive. So in middle school, high school. We don't group kids in word language classes based on grade level, based on proficiency. Okay, so you might step in into Arabic one class and find uh, a sixth grader with a seventh grader because it's based on proficiency. Same thing with Spanish and French. Uh, K1 and K2, 30 minutes every other day. And grade one to two, 30 minutes daily. Grades three to five, 40 minutes daily. And then middle school, high school, 70 to 80 minutes on a block system every other day. We, we strongly believe in the importance of daily uh, exposure to the language. Okay, and there is also a research that tells us about this. Mr. Yes. 30 minutes enough? By the time uh, the, the, the kids are in the class, sit down. Focus, yeah. How much your question, you your question, yes, it is enough. It is enough because I can't be, I can't be practically sitting in a five hour class Another. and learning nothing. Okay, and I can be sitting in a 20 minutes class and learning a lot. So from this perspective, yes, it is enough. Can we, can, we can always do more, we can do 45 minutes, we can do one hour, right. So, but also we have to take into consideration that there are other subjects in the schedule. It's not only Arabic, so that's something we have to consider as well. Uh, so what, what is the curriculum about? The curriculum is we have a framework that tells us as teachers and educators what are the learning targets for each level. What students should be able to do in the language. And pay attention here, be able to do, not to know. Not necessarily they can list those words and those vocab and those grammatical rules. This is, this is important, but this is not an end. Okay, it's a mean to an end. What they can do with the language. Uh, and then those learning targets guide the planning, the teaching, the assessment, and the grading. So to give you an example, this is, let's say, Arabic 1. For speaking, the learning target would be, I can talk about my school schedule. So I can tell when I come to the school what I do in the morning, what's my first class, second class, etc. For listening, I can follow classroom instructions. When the teacher is speaking to me, giving me instructions in Arabic, I can follow. Uh, reading, I can read an ID. It's very basic still, after I've acquired the letters, of course. Uh, and then writing, I can label my classroom items. Just to give you of how much specific we can be to identify those learning targets as we plan, as we teach, as we assess, as we grade. And those, if you step in Arabic classrooms, you will see those posted on the walls as well. So, <laughs> so it's, not, it's not a secret we hide from the kids. These are for the kids, actually, because it's I can. It's, not for, it's for the child, I can, not for the student, not for the uh, parent. So this is, this is kind of show you the ladder of proficiency. So if a child starts at ASD learning Arabic in elementary, and if they continue to learning Arabic up till grade 12, they will go from the novice to what we call the advanced, the advanced proficiency level. And then each one of those shows exactly what students will be able to do at each sub-level. So the novice is based on three sub-levels, novice low, novice mid, novice high, intermediate low, mid high, and then advanced low, mid, and high. And this is, by the way, the framework of the American Council of Teaching Foreign Languages that was designed for Arabic. Okay? 
so again, all Arabic classrooms has this posted on the wall clearly and a big font for kids to be always to see. So kids can say, oh, I'm here. I'm in Novice Smith because I can speak in lists. I can, I have in my storage 50 plus words. And then to move to the Novice High, I need to be able to combine words and phrases into full sentences. So they have exactly kind of a tip what they need to work on in order to, uh, yes. This is a very important slide to share with you. And then we will, we will have this on the, uh, on the website, right? Okay. I can, I can email it to you as well, all right? Yeah, because this is really, this is, this is what is it about, okay? So Arabic program events. Uh, with, this is the fifth year we host an Arabic author, popular in the Arab world, uh, Sahar Mahfouz. She will be here November for 11 to 14. Uh, most of her time will be with kids. So during Arabic class, they will come to her, and then she will read them stories. And then they will ask her questions about her professional life as well, in Arabic. Uh, on November 13, she will have a talk Tuesday for parents in Arabic. Okay, so feel free to come. Uh, yeah, we're very excited about, uh, about her visit. November 13. At this, at this. Yes, what we do, yeah, before that, what we do is that we introduce the kids to who is coming, we talk about her life a bit, we read them some stories, so they're familiar and excited. So when she comes, uh, they're more aware of her. Speaking of books, do they go to the library and I, I will speak about this, and, and yeah, we're coming to that. Thank you. Did you see my slides? No. Oh, okay, <laughs> just checking. I forgot that you saw my presentation before. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, the Arabic book fair, we used to do the Arabic book fair at a different time. But if you notice, it's the same week of the Arabic author. It made sense to us, that's a learning that we, we got to, that it's more enriching if we have the Arabic book fair running at the same time with the Arabic author visit. Okay? And we will make sure at the book fair that we'll have samples of her books provided for kids to buy or for you to buy, and then she can also sign them. We'll have some signature. Uh, oh, not, we didn't have toys last year? Yeah. Like the yeah, exactly. Okay, because when I meet with the providers, I make sure there are not maybe educational yeah. toys yeah. Arabic. No, but like no, but they had some. No, the, the English, not the Arabic. The okay, English. because I tell them okay if they have some educational toys like cubes with letters yeah. or those kind of things, but not like. No, they have other stuff that uh, okay. kids talk about. So let me make sure. Okay, all right. So, and feel free to. Uh, I think what's helpful to parents is that when you buy your kids. Uh, if they're able to read those what we call readers in Arabic, okay? Because we have, for the novice law, <coughs> we have a set of books that they can read at that level, and then the novice smith. Those are very helpful for you as parents and at they home. Are set, set, sets. Exactly. They're sets. Possible? Yes. No, would it be possible to segregate, segregate the books so we know as parents? We are doing this this year. Because it wasn't like that. Yes, we are doing this this year. Okay. And there will be more than one person helping with the book fair. Right. They can also can direct you to the, uh, to the level, okay? So kids come during Arabic class and buy books, and they can also buy books after school or before school, and you can at any time come. And, uh, we're doing it in the grade three hallway, uh, so it's, it's convenient. Okay, uh, we'll, give, we'll give more uh, logistics about it when it comes. You cannot, you cannot pay by card, for example, it has to be cash. Yeah. <laughs> We have like one a day or one a week. three years ago, we ordered more than 2,000 plus books of children literature in Arabic to the library. So, and several of those are kind of leveled. Uh, but you might need some support, some help sometimes to, if you don't know Arabic, to, to know which level you need to I check out. Yes, it. yes. Yes, yes, yes. And we really, to, to order this collection, it took us time because we wanted to order quality in illustrations and plots because it's easy to go the other way where it's really boring. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes. You mean this is kind of bilingual or transliteration? I need to check. Yeah, I will check. I'll follow up on this. Okay. And the librarians know they can help with 
with Arabic books? Sorry? The librarians, are they, oh. are they informed? Can they help? The library, I, I just met yesterday actually with the librarian, Mrs. Yes. Natasha, on ways of supporting the book fair from the library. So they will have, will have a display of the author's visit, books there, and then they will have kind of when they announce it on market, they will have a big poster of the Arabic author visiting. But they don't know Arabic. Yes, but as in, in general, if I'm going to the library with my child and ah, I'm telling see. them this, he is this grade level, will they know where to direct me to get which book? I need to check to be honest. To be honest, I can't, yeah, I can't, but that's a good question. Okay. Or maybe if we label them at least uh, clearly, you will be able to know on your own. Good, okay. Now, speaking of this from an educator's point of view also, when we think of reading specifically, it's very important not to think of the difficulty of the text, but the difficulty of the task we're asking the child to do with the text. Does this make sense? Because we might read a very simple story, I'm asking a very complex task to do and demonstrating the comprehension, okay, or a writing response. And it might be somehow a difficult story, but I might just tell him summarize it in one sentence. Or tell me five words you understood. You see what I'm saying? So let's keep this in mind when you work with your children at home with reading. It's not only the difficulty of the story, it's what you ask them to do with it as well, okay? So that's for the book fair. Uh, the a National Day, oh, sorry. The National Day celebrations, uh, it's a big event, especially for elementary school. Uh, we, at the green field outside, we have multiple stations with external providers. Uh, and thanks to the help of many of our parents as well in organizing it on that day, where kids come and enjoy the National Day uh, as well. So it says of dancing, music, and eating the local food, those kind of things. And parents are welcome as well. Uh, the Arabic week, and April 28th to May 2nd, also a variety of activities. Here where I talk about the language and the culture and the importance of that. So we have, last year we had an Arabic calligrapher coming, uh, who met with the kids and he taught them different kinds of Arabic calligraphy and they practiced as well writing their names. Uh, dances where they can join, an Arabic music group where they learn some songs in Arabic, those kind of things. So it's not only the language, it's also the cultural component of it. So you can really get involved in uh, helping us uh, organize those events, not necessarily before time, but during that National Day or that Arabic Week. So feel free to reach out to the Arabic teachers or myself saying, hey, I can, I can help, let me know. We welcome that. And guest speakers, we had, uh, we had uh, last year and even the year before, uh, parents coming to the class and reading stories to the kids in Arabic. We usually send a sign up, sign up sheet. And I, I thank, I don't know that, Several parents here in this audience came and read stories to the kids. That was very good. It was, really it was very welcomed by the kids. Yes, so they love it. Okay, so if you know how to read Arabic, uh, please let us know. You can come and we can sign you up with the teacher and the class and you can read a story as well. Okay? It's, it's a half day this year. Yeah, it's an early release. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a full day. So at 12, alas. Okay, so talking about the books, I think we talked about this, okay? Well, we have a mix of fiction and non-fiction as well. Uh, uh, we have two, I want to talk to you about two digital, very important programs that can support learning at school and at home. And really, they are the top quality that are available in the market right now. Uh, the Arabic education recently realized that they're absent digitally. Okay. So they start all those companies, they contact us and contact schools promoting their programs. 99%? No, exactly. Okay, so this is really good quality. I read Arabic, so every child uh, in elementary school will have access to this digital online library. The stories are leveled scientifically, okay? And kids can read them, record their voice when they're reading them, and then answer kind of questions, interact with the story, answer kind of comprehension questions about them as well. Sorry, this okay. is the I read Arabic. Uh, they can use this. We have each child has a username and a password. Uh, it's coming. Hello. We, we paid for it recently. So, what do you mean, why? 
It wasn't, no, no. It wasn't from our side. It was from the company's side. We sent them. Because he used to, like my son used to do that in a previous school. Mm -hmm. The Iron Arabic? Yeah. And uh, for the last three years. It's not a new app. And same for, okay, it's irrelevant, but like for math, digital uh, practice also at home. Till now, we didn't have anything. It wasn't the delay from our side. We sent the student names from the beginning of the school year. But maximum by next week, actually, we, we were sent the usernames and the passwords already for kids. So teachers are giving them to the kids, and they want to teach them how to access it and how to, uh, how to deal with it. So on a positive note, it's here. OK? But can you email the parents as well? Let me think about and think of logistically how can teachers Email like individual seesaw. parents. Yeah, just like seesaw. Okay. Last year, you Okay. Or even a printout in the back. Okay, well, let's think about how to logistically do that. Yes. In this app? Ah, okay. So, so going back to some, some uh, teaching practices for the grammar. Yes, we teach a grammar, okay? But the difference is how we teach it and how kids learn it. We teach it functionally. It means that we don't necessarily spend uh, 30 minutes talking about adverbs and prepositions. We don't do this in English even, okay? But how, if let's say I want to talk about my last weekend, how to use the past tense correctly? This way, okay? So, about verbs or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, but we don't go into the very, very tiny details that they do not need in real life. Yes. 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 In the, the, in the native, the, the grammar load would be a bit heavier. Heavier than the. Yes, the, makes the, sense, uh, right? Okay. So that's for I read Arabic. Now, this year we're starting with also another program. I start Arabic, and I start Arabic as the I read Arabic focuses on reading. I start Arabic on speaking and listening. So it's a variety of audiovisual material and videos under different themes. The shapes, the colors, the numbers, the letters, food, whatever it is, where kids can watch them, interact with them. And uh, there are worksheets as well in that platform where they can build up their speaking and listening uh, skills as well. So that, that's the new one. We're also introducing it this year for all kids uh, in elementary school. Yes, that's a different username and password because it's a different, same company, but different platform. Okay? Did you say it was not the native? It's not natives, but you think it could be using it in both? Yeah, but also the natives will have access to it. Yes, yes. Okay? So, and this is, this is uh, provided by the Arabic department. So. I think it's, uh, so, when you think of ways of support at home, that's a great, anytime, any place, it can, it can access it. Yes. Okay. Sure, just give us the passwords. <laughs> we'll do. I mean, sorry, you keep saying, so obviously it's very important to support our children. But, um, and I'm sure it's in another slide, sorry to... It is. It about that, but, <laughs> um, it's about briefing us every week of exactly what our children do. Okay, can you wait for me? Also, yes, also I'm addressing this. <laughs> Thank you. All right, okay, good. So because what, before I prepare the presentation, what kind of questions or information parents want to ask? It makes sense, right? Because it's for you. So I put myself in your shoes, and then we design the information accordingly, right? Okay, there's also the Arabic resource page uh, in elementary school where teachers across the years have also gathered quality uh, video clips and songs and those kind of things uh, that can support your child's it's learning. On power. This is on power learning, yes. Okay? And this is kind of the tech resources that are available at school as well. We have a variety of, uh, we're fortunate to have this tech support. And we have tech coaches also that work with the Arabic teachers closely on helping the kids use Arabic programs, Arabic software, language programs, and those kind of things. Uh, okay. so. Let me, let me have you think about your role, whether you know Arabic or not, about your role, a parent role, about supporting your child's Arabic learning at home, outside school. 
So when we think about the percentage, if you want to think about the percentage, who is responsible for your child's Arabic learning? We have the teacher, we have the parent, and we have the student. These are the stakeholders, right? So what percentage, what percentage would you, would you give yourself? Would you give the teacher and would you give the child? Okay, so just have a quick chat with the person next to you for 30 seconds and then we can discuss. Okay. Thank you very much. Any, any, maybe I'll just take one or two responses. Any insights? There is no right or correct answer percentage, by the way. It's not math, right? Okay. 50% for the parents. 50% for, okay. 50% for the teachers. Exactly. 50% for the teachers. Okay. The kids can't appreciate the language at school and learn the hate at school. It's not going to care for it. Okay. Okay. So we have, we have, a variety of responses. Yeah, yeah. From your own experience. Okay. So you give more percentage to the to the teacher as well. Yes. I mean, because they're at school most of the time. Yes, they're not learning Arabic all the time, but they're at school most of the time. So obviously, their teachers not, should have a hundred percent time. But we barely see them at home. Okay. Okay. Especially the. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, You're taking me as an example. Okay. Take as an example, right? Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. So at the same time, yeah. in my experience, in my experience also, I had a very supportive uh, uh, Arabic learning environment at home, where we used to play Monopoly in Arabic and read stories in Arabic and you know those kind of things. My father used to play Oud and used to learn Arabic. So we had this very supportive. Uh, but yeah, certainly the Arabic teacher helped me major in Arabic. Okay, so there is there is a responsibility. Whether we agree it's 50% to the teacher, to the parent, there is a responsibility as parents how we can support at home, outside school, okay? So let's think about, also I'm gonna give you a minute to share with the person next to you or behind you or in front of you if you want to change, what things you can do. Let's learn from each other. What things you can do, maybe simple things, whether if you know Arabic or not, to support that Arabic learning at home. Take a minute. Okay, shukran, thank you. Any ideas? Just shout out some ideas. What, what do you do? You're chatting in the car, because we're stuck in the car for at least 30 minutes. You chat about what? Just tell me a word. Tell me the colors you learned today. Okay. I'm speaking from a Okay. So taking advantage of the transportation time, and just have, okay. Thank you. Arabic songs, okay. Arabic games, TV. Games like what? Games like what? Well, I mean, even playing Hangman, but the Arabic. Okay. All right. Uh, we should change the name of this game from Hangman. Okay. Make it more peaceful. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. TV shows. Okay. Are you labeling stuff around the house? Labeling stuff around the house. Nice. Okay. an activity in Arabic, like cooking. Like, you know, doing that. We're using the language. Yes. Right? Great. Okay. Wonderful ideas. So these are the ideas that I've gathered through the years from parents. Okay? So just have a look. I want to draw your attention to the second point as well, which you can have in English, but discussing it with your child gives it value as well. Now, I know from, I know from my daughter, 
when I asked her, what did you learn in school today? Nothing. It was good. <laughs> or nothing. Okay, so we have to be a bit pushy sometimes, okay? A bit, a bit uh, another time when we ask them as well. Sometimes they're tired, okay? And this is, this is a very important point as well. Okay, praising them and, and congratulating them and reinforcing them, it's really, really important. Is your child, is your daughter in ASD? She is, yes, she is in ASD. Yes, in grade she's six. She's learning Arabic with me. She learned Arabic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she learned Arabic. She, she learned Arabic up to grade five. And then she wants to take uh, Spanish. So the agreement with her was, and there is a signed agreement, that, she, that she, she studies Arabic with me three times a week. And if she doesn't do well, then she has to take it back because she wants to be Spanish. Yes. Uh, let your child teach you Arabic. It was, or the song, or the vocab they're learning as well. So, so sorry, just a question. So now your daughter does Spanish as a second language, and then I just want to know how it works. Yes. And then the A W L, which is Arabic as a world language, right? That's the system. I'm, I'm not sure I got the question. She's not taking Arabic at this point. At all. At all. Because she's not registered under an Arab. Yeah, no, she's 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 uh, an American citizen as well. Okay, I get. But do you agree that she's they exempted from the system? But do you agree they should continue with Arabic regardless if they can choose another language? That's a philosophical issue. That's yeah. that's a philosophical issue. I know we are an Arab country, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, it's a ministry requirement. Okay, so why don't we have that many schools have to have to give that kids have to take Arabic up to grade nine. Okay, now there are logistical components. So that, as I said, I don't have the right answer for it. Uh, but all those who are under Arab passport have to be in native, as we said. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, but, but just, uh, so she had the option of doing AWL, or she doesn't have that option at all? All kids have all the option kids. to take Arabic all the time. Yeah. Throughout. Throughout. Plus, plus a third language. Yes. yes. Plus no. Spanish. No. No. Just, no. 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 Elective is one. It's a in middle school, in middle school and high school, yeah. they they have a word language requirement that they have to take. Okay. okay? Just one. If they, are, if they have to take native because of their passport, then the native will not be considered, it will be considered as a core subject. It won't be considered as a world language option. So we do not, as a way of supporting them, enabling them to choose another language, whether it's Spanish or French, they can do that. Makes sense? So the native, Arabic native, because they have to take it because of their passport, it's not a world language credit. Oh, that's a different case. Okay? So we can we can talk about this more, but let's because I want to show you really the clip as well before you go. Okay? All right. Uh, just ways of keeping you informed about the Arabic program happenings. These are just samples for you to, to note. Uh, as I said, we have two talk Tuesdays. Watch for the ASD news. From time to time, I personally write things about the Arabic program. So uh, look for that. See it at conferences, the divisional ones, as you know, the progress reports and report cards as well. This year we're starting an elementary school, a bi-monthly electronic newsletter that will go home, that will give you a clearer idea of what kids are learning and what's upcoming in terms of the units and the, and the learning as well. Why not weekly like the normal class? Weekly is too, is too much in terms of uh, by monthly, so there is there is a good quantity of things to share with you. By weekly, it's I don't think even and, and like I, when I checked with K, even they send it on a monthly basis. I think so. You have a clearer idea of some things to share with you on a bi monthly. If we send it bi monthly and then we feel that there is a need to send it more on a monthly basis, we can discuss that. But I'd rather start on a bi monthly, assess the need, and then they say, okay, you know, we might need to send it on a monthly basis. Because no matter what, my fourth grader, my first grader, whatever they're learning, even if it's one line from their teacher on Seesaw or on uh, the power. Power learning. Okay. It's just so we know that, okay, so this week we learned the letters Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha. And we focused on uh, the colors and blah, blah, blah. That way we can teach the kids and support them in the house, like you said, that we need to support with their learning. But to get it after one and a half months, or get it once a month, and they would have already, like, I would not... But you can continue working with them, even if, if bi-weekly. You can see what they've learned, the practice, and see what's coming.
and practice with it. And if, if there is a need on a weekly basis, you can always approach the teacher directly, right? And tell her, okay. okay those. But again, this is not set in stone. It's, we're starting it this year, and if we, we can assess the need accordingly as well. All right? By the end of this month, inshallah. Okay, and there is also seesaw power learning, and again, your child's Arabic teacher. Like, sometimes as parents, I encourage them, we send information, some parents tell us you're sending too much information, some parents tell us you're sending nothing. So it's sometimes there is this perspective as well. So feel free to reach out as well. Thank you very much, okay. okay. And then your child as well. Uh, as I said, ask them what, what they're learning in, in Arabic in the class. Uh, let's watch. Mention haiku, everything is also there. Ha haiku is power learning. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. the new. Yes. yes. So I'm, I'm going to have you watch a very short clip of snapshots from Arabic classrooms. Uh, and I, while, while watching it, I want you to note those questions. Just think about those questions in your head. Okay, I know we're over time, but we're almost there. Is it okay to go over time a bit? Yeah. Okay. Think about those questions. We'll watch and then we'll go back to those items. Okay? الليمون في حياتك ثلاث مرات ثلاث مرات ثالثه ممتاز ممتاز students were engaged in this brief clip why what did, what told you that they were engaged speaking movement doing okay interaction okay they're busy uh, what do you think the teacher's role was in those activities guidance facilitate all right so what kind of activities we've seen can we name them cooking puppet show Planting, planting labeling, 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 items in the garden, conversation, conversation. what else? Role playing. role playing, reading a recipe. Mm -hmm. if, you see, if you've seen this, that they will have them mm -hmm. slips of paper mm -hmm. and they group. This is reading comprehension. They have to put things in the right order in the text. Questions? Yes. Questions? Now, two questions we can do it two ways. Uh, we can either, we have no questions and we all leave right now. Or if you have questions for all of us, we can stay all of us. But feel free to leave right now because we're over time. Okay, but I'm here. I can stay for a few more minutes. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>